And I want to clarify the assertion about um, the proportion of variation in kids' achievement is due to families because we, we read the sort of the sociological literature and, and this work about family effects on kids comes out of some uh, work that James Coleman did many years ago and has been reinforced again and again and more recently by Doug Wilm's analysis of OEC data too. So we know that um, families make a difference to the learning of kids in schools. But let's just kind of be clear about what's actually being said there. It, it is not that 50% of student achievement um, takes place outside of schools. It's the variation between schools and their achievement that we're talking about. I mean, this is st statisticians talking in ways that are easily confusing. So the, what, what that number means is that if school A has, you know, 80% of their kids performing at level three on the literacy test, and school B has 50% of their kids performing at level three on the literacy test, there's 30% of the variation to be accounted for. Of that, 40 or 50% is accounted for by differences in what schools are doing. Now, this has often been interpreted, understood the first way, as kind of depressing. You mean we do all this for kids and we have them in school for all these years and still families account for that much of what they learn. Schools account for an enormous amount of kids learning. We're only talking about differences in the learning that takes place in one school versus another. But every school produces a huge amount. How many kids are going to learn algebra in their families, right? one percent you know so the skills kids develop in in every school is enormous but some schools get a little bit more out of it than others and 50 percent of that little more is accounted for by families it's still a big amount it's still probably the elephant in the room when you're thinking about making marginal improvements to your kids achievement because that's what we're doing right not only that but we're making marginal improvements in the achievement of kids and I say this advisedly, who are part of the best education system in the world. Ontario performs enormously well on international comparisons. It'll be interesting to see what the 2011 OECD data have to say. But you know, Ontario ranked second or third in the 2009 results with Finland, which is a silly comparison. Uh, so unlike the circumstances of Ontario, ranking first. And so here is a heterogeneous large population of kids scoring almost as good as any kids in the world, followed by the results of the pan-Canadian tests, where kids in Ontario scored above the average on all the tests of math, literacy, and science, the only province that had that performance. So <laughs> we're talking, this is important for us all to understand. We're pushing against a very high ceiling right now. And, and we have to ask what drivers, as Michael Fullen would say, what drivers are likely to push us even higher? It's not the usual ones, right? I mean, as much as we have to continue to work on the quality of instruction in the school, we have amazing teachers who've had enormous amounts of professional development around the quality of instruction. And you know, many, many of them are doing as much as kind of the evidence suggests we know how to do in their classrooms. Where are we gonna get that marginal advantage to take it to the next level? Well, we do know from a lot of data that we've been collecting in the province that, that establishing effective working relationships with families is a very much underutilized driver of education uh, improvement. So uh, bringing, bringing us back to the question, um, connecting, fam connecting with families in ways that change the educational culture in the home is what we're trying to accomplish here. We know from a lot of evidence that bringing parents into the school uh, to participate in decision making and the like um, has maybe useful effects 
on one of the three goals in Ontario, you know, building support for public education, but it doesn't do anything for kids' achievement. We have to get at things in the family that now we're learning more about have a big effect on both the social and intellectual capital kids then bring to school. I mean, the elephant in that room is parental expectations. As John Hattie said, an, an analysis shows us, um, it, it probably the, has the largest effect on kids' achievement of any of the other things that are part of what I'm calling the educational culture in the home. But there are lots of pieces that go into making a productive educational culture. It's certainly parental expectations, but it's also support for you know, getting through homework at, in the evening. Uh, it's uh, support for um, valuing intellectual work, which sometimes simply gets displayed when kids see their parents doing homework on their own job-related things. It's about encouraging kids uh, with their parents to travel outside their own communities and to kind of explore what they're learning and what they're seeing in those communities. It's, it's being supportive of what the school's doing by saying nice things about teachers and teaching rather than always being critical verbally in a family context about what the school is doing. It's providing that supportive environment in the home that allows kids to come to school already motivated to learn. And that's the big, I think that's the big piece. Uh, that, that, that explains the effect parental expectations have. Kids come to school, they want to learn. The school itself doesn't have to produce all the motivation for learning. It's like we're pushing a rock up a hill. If the, kid, if the school has to produce all of, all of the motivation for, for students to learn, you want, you want the family to be a partner in producing that motivation.